Hello, my name is Sammy. I'm Emma. I'm Paya. And we are from the Santa Barbara Middle School Team Press. And today we're here with... Chris Yeager. Very nice to meet you. Really nice to meet you, Sammy. Okay, so we understand that you grew up here. Tell us about one of your favorite memories of growing up in Santa Barbara. My favorite memories of growing up in Santa Barbara, it was living outside. I think that um, not many people uh, in many parts of the world get to um, have the kind of outdoor life that I got to have growing up and uh, just being able to play in the water and play in the mountains and be on bikes and skateboards. And um, I don't really remember doing things indoors. Great. So how did you become friends with Brian, our headmaster? Uh, you know, my first memory of, of Brian was when I was probably three years old. And he was a year older than I was. And he was, um, he was always a big kid. And uh, so when a big kid is older than you, you kind of just follow around with them. And we were at a swim club. And I just remember following Brian into all kinds of trouble. And I just remember people always coming out from like closed doors and saying like, what are you doing? And, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so that was my reality growing up with Brian. And I don't think much changed until high school, maybe even, maybe even after high school. But Brian was always the one out in front kind of uh, leading into, um, into, into, into places where maybe we weren't supposed to be where, where all the fun was. <laughs> What kinds of places? Oh, just, I mean, it was all tame. It was relatively tame. I'm not going to include Relatively? Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Brian's a super good guy. Okay. Yeah, I wouldn't say anything bad about Brian. Okay. We learned that you were among the first students in the exchange program with China in the seven, 1970s. Can you tell us more about that, ex about that experience and how it shaped your life? Yeah, absolutely. So it was actually in the 1980s, and um, China had a, a, a massive transformation in its political reality in 1976. Um, the three biggest, sort of most powerful leaders in China all died that year. And in the Chinese calendar, it's the year of the dragon. And um, there was also this incredible earthquake that happened that year. There were all these really auspicious things that happened. And the country, like, it just changed. It went and from one reality to another in the span, well, it happened in this sort of one year, but it took a couple years for the, the new reality to take hold. And in the old reality, China didn't have relationships with mm -hmm. other countries. They had like relationships with three countries. But then after the new reality and, and this old guard died, they opened up to the rest of the world. And, and I think it was around 1980, they normalized relations with the United States and they started um, permitting students to come and study. And I think the first students arrived in China in 83 or 84. And I went there in 87. And even in 1987, three or four years after they had started allowing foreign students to travel there, um, there were only a couple hundred of us. And we were the only foreigners living in the entire country. Um, and did your, was your question like, how did it change my, my worldview or something? Because um, it changed everything yeah. for me. Um, and I think that what was the most significant change was, um, was that it got me really to question at a deep level how much, um, uh, how, what kinds of social constructs allow for individuals to realize the sort of fulfillment of their being. Because in China, you have um, a country that for a very long time has had too many people and too few resources. And it's very difficult to grow food in China. It's was why like the, all every bit of land that can grow food is being used to grow food. Like you can take a train across China and you will not see a forest. Like you'll just, everything is being farmed. And, um, and seeing the reality of all of these different pressures and the, and the challenges of, um, of living within those pressures and developing a society that can sustain itself with all of those pressures. And then what, what are the opportunities for individuals to actually um, express themselves and become themselves? And it's really different. There's just bigger limitations and individuals don't get the same opportunities to decide for themselves like who they want to be and how they want to live their lives. And, uh, and so I came back really in, like interested in so, so, you know, what are sort of economic and political and social constructs that um, enable uh, a society, a world, 
to live with limited resources and to be able to sustain itself and to be able to nurture the individual? That's a big answer, but that's sort of like, that, I went on to college and I studied that and I kind of, and I feel like my work life, life after that was sort of deeply engaged in that fundamental question, um, uh, which is um, how does a, a, a number of people with limited resources sustain itself without burning out those resources mm -hmm. and still allowing for individuals to become their fullest selves? Yeah.